most of my life I've been fascinated with megalithic stones because I was lucky enough to be brought up in the area of the Lake District which, as maybe a few of you know, has some of the largest concentration of megalithic sites in the country. And I had quite a few interesting experiences up there as a teenager and in my 20s, which led to researching ley lines and this the Bellinus or Bellinus line that runs up and down the country from the Isle of Wight to Durness in Scotland. But um, I'd like to talk about one of my early experiences which led to these discoveries, or certainly my awareness. Um, anybody recognise this site in Cumbria? It's Swinside Stone Circle. It's in a remote part of sort of western Cumbria. And it's an intact stone circle. There's nothing, no stones have been taken away. And it's a great place to sort of hang out in the summer. And I spent the whole day on summer solstice at this site, um, right from the first thing in the morning to the last thing at night, as megalithomaniacs do. Um, and I experienced some, an incredible um, sort of insight to the stone circle because just because there's animals around at certain times, the animals will come into the stone circle and then leave at a certain time. And um, as the sun was setting, I made observations of a certain notch, so that the circle was placed with the gateway directly to the setting sun at summer solstice. Um, and as this um, uh, event was taking place, I took a photograph inside the circle. And this was just a 35 millimeter film of my old Practica camera with a Carl Zeus lens for those photographers around. So it wasn't digital. And you see this, this extraordinary line um, in the grass. Uh, of course, I didn't know what was going on at the time, but I felt there was some tension in, in the circle, but not knowing what was happening. So I walked away, and uh, right down by the end of the wall, I, I noticed there was a, this straight burn mark in the grass. And um, I followed this burn mark, and it went through a, a megalith that's... Um, lying in the grass here. And it, the, this line, as straight as a die, went straight into the circle. And it wasn't there before because I'd spent all day there walking around, never seen it. Suddenly, after the sun had gone down, this uh, line appeared. Um, and I got thinking maybe this is some kind of um, energy that, it, that was given off from the circle and somehow scorched the grass. And you can see with a black and white photograph. So I, I, f I took a photograph of it from the circle. Can you see it in the distance there? Yeah. And, and actually, when, when I travelled further over the wall here, it actually went over for, for over a mile. So and nobody's ever seen anything. I've never seen any information like this before, but um, the energy that had built up in this circle had been released at sunset. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> so here you see in black and white how clear this, um, through the megalith, that probably once was a standing stone. So after having this experience, I started to understand that some of these sites communicate with each other. And I had other experiences, a place called Boot, um, which is up in Estale. And there are some circles up there in a remote area. And I went up to... Um, to explore them, and I, I started to dig around in one of the middle, in the middle of one of the circles because there was a raised mound. Foolishly, not ask, not giving, getting permission from guardians, just going into the site. And it was a clear, sunny evening, and um, suddenly I heard this distant rumble, um, like in these horror films. And um, then these clouds started to roll up um, as I was playing about with this, this cairn in the middle of the circle. And, of course, this area is a high plateau, and it took us an hour to get up to this, these circles. Uh, but suddenly the hail came down, and uh, I managed to get down in five minutes. It, it was a, a frightening experience. So I, I learned about the power of these sites as well, and that these sites can actually affect the weather. And it's linked with Orgon, of course, and probably tachyon energies. 
So after many years, I decided to research and explore the Michael alignment, which I discovered through John Michel's books. Uh, New View over Atlantis was, I suppose, every megalithomaniac's Bible. And um, so I decided to um, do a pilgrimage from Land's End to Glastonbury. Um, and as I was going along the pilgrimage, I had a sense there was a north-south equivalent to the Michael Line, because the Michael Line is almost the longest line you can stretch east-west as a through route, if you get what I mean, a pilgrim route. And um, I felt that maybe there is a line coming through Avebury, but um, as I arrived at Glastonbury, I was hanging out one of the bookshops, and you know, as you do, certain books fly off the shelf, and, and there was Brigantia by Guy Raglan Phillips, and he mentions this alignment called the Bellinus Line. And um, what, what he, in the, back in the early 70s, he had actually um, took a load of maps out, detailed maps, and found a web network of alignments. And these alignments were north-south and east-west. Uh, the north actually 13.5 degrees of true north. Um, and the east-west lines were irregular, but the north-south lines were 12 miles apart. And these were lays, um, in other words, alignments of sites, not, as we would imagine, dowsing currents or earth energies. And the best of these lines through Brigantia, which of course is the old Celtic kingdom of, uh, sort of Lancashire and Cheshire, was this line that passed through two node points uh, near Clitheroe. And, um, he called it the Bellinus Line because this line could extend down to Winchester, which was the ancient capital of England, and associated with some early kings. And he also read the legend of King Bellinus from the 500 BC, who built these roads throughout Britain, straight roads leading from sanctuary. And of course, Winchester being one of the old sanctuaries before London, um, he thought this was one of Bellinus's roads. So he named it the Bellinus Line, or the Bellinus Line. And what impressed me about this particular line that Guy Raglan had discovered was its orientation. It, um, it, it almost forms a perfect through route. Uh, the only great body of water you'd have to cross would be the Firth of Forth. But uh, as you can see in, in the left-hand side, right-hand side, um, it actually crosses the fourth, where two great fingers of land come together, as if um, it was you know, almost nature was pointing to a, a sacred crossing. And it was also a fording point at low tide. Um, so I thought that was key, because any, any line from the top of Scotland to the bottom of England as a through route is going to have to cross the fourth. Um, and so this seemed to be coincidentally um, uh, perfect for um, a through route. And we also discovered that um, the line crosses the Thames at one of the most ancient uh, bridges, Radcott, uh, which is protected by um, Farringdon Folly and the palace of King Alfred. Uh, at Shrugborough, the long, one of the longest rivers, Trent, crosses it, uh, there. And Shrugborough is a site of the bishops of Lichfield, where they had their palace. Um, fording places are very important to ancient peoples. And um, Didsbury is one of the earliest um, religious sites in the Great Manchester area, as Wally. And uh, Wally was the Cistercian Abbey there. And it's also a very important little village, as we'll go into later. Devil's Bridge is another sacred site on the River Loon where the line crosses through, of course. And then Fortivia in Scotland was the great royal centre of the Picts. And of course, Inverness is another royal centre. Now, what it, the other thing I noticed about the line was that, unlike the Michael line, which passes through great hilltop sanctuaries and spiritual places of power, such as Avebury and Glastonbury, the uh, Bellina signs seem to pass through cities, both modern and ancient. Now, Winchester once was the capital of England during Saxon and Norman times for about 500 years before London. 
Uh, Carlisle was the, known as the capital of the north from Roman times to past Norman times. Uh, unfortunately, it, didn't, it missed Edinburgh, this line, but it goes through Dunfermline. But we discovered after travelling up there that Dunfermline was a Saxon and Norman capital of Scotland. So this line actually connects three old capitals. And then, of course, Laird further up was uh, the this, this sort of sacred centre of Caithness. So and when I discovered through travelling the world and meeting indigenous tribes that they always speak about these lines. And um, they say the east-west lines are spiritual lines and the north-south lines are physical lines, which made a lot of sense to me because... Um, the north-south lines, uh, the Belenus line, is connecting with physical centres of power. Because Manchester and Birmingham are not known sacred sites, but if you think about it, they were the most powerful cities in the world in Victorian times. The, the greatest industries that, that affected the, and influenced the whole world came out of those two cities. The cotton industry and uh, textiles in Manchester, and nearly everything that was produced in Birmingham, um, nearly every home 100 years ago had something produced in Birmingham all over the world. So it made me think, I wonder if these cities were placed deliberately upon this axis. Because Guy Raglan also thought that this axis may coincide with magnetic north, because the, the, uh, the uh, magnetic pole moves from east to west um, over a, period, a long period of time. And at one time, Magnetic North may have fallen upon the balloon sign. So maybe it was laid down at one particular time. But to me, it's also a through route. So it may also be a pilgrim route, because he also discovered, Guy Raglan, sections of road, ancient road, throughout, Northam, throughout the, uh, the northern fells around Carlisle, which may indicate there was a, a route along this um, alignment. Now, the other interesting aspect of this line is the geographical centres. I remember um, I was talking to John Michel many years ago about this alignment, and um, we was, uh, it was in a private um, club above a pub in London. And um, he sat down and, and mentioned um, Mion. He said, the only thing that interests me about your line, he says, is Mion. He said, because it means middle. And it occurs twice on your line. So he said that in itself is interesting, because it's an ancient British word. He said the alignment starts nearly on Solent, at where the Meon Estuary begins, at Titchfield, and goes through Meon Hill. Um, at Wally, uh, we'd, when we first arrived there, following or researching the alignment, we discovered that, according to the Ordnance Survey, Wally is the geographical centre of mainland Britain. Okay, so th this has been worked out by a computer that this, or, and balancing a, um, a, a cutout of the, of the mainland Britain on, on a, to find a central point, and Wally is this place. And very few people know Wally. It's, it's just a little village, northern town, with a couple of dark satanic mills, as you often find. And, uh, but there's a Cistercian Abbey there, and these ancient crosses. But Meon Hill is also um, associated with legend, witchcraft, pagan, the occult. And at the foot of Meon Hill is Luddington. And Luddington basically means Ludd's town. <clears throat> and King Ludd, <clears throat> rather like Bellinus, is one of those legendary kings of Britain. Does it ever, do you ever wonder why, you know, before the Roman times, all our kings were leg are legendary? You know, there's, there's, it's all right. After the Roman times, they're real kings, but before Roman times, they're legendary and mythical. You know, it's, it's propaganda. You know. <laughs> well, let's not go into politics. I'm sure you've had enough of that over the last few days. But, but you can't, you cannot separate politics and history. It's the same thing. But anyway, this King Lud, mythical King Lud, or real King Lud, I don't know, he set out to find the centre of England, uh, and some. Geoffrey Monmouth, who wrote in the medieval times, thought it was Oxford. But it, it seemed a coincidence that Meon, meaning Middle Hill, and um, Ludd's town just near it, it may be referring to this as a centre. Now, Wally, going back to Wally, 
Um, there is these ancient Saxon crosses. Some say they're earlier than uh, the very early Saxon. And they're full of spirals and pyramid shapes. And um, it's as if it was a very important place in early Christian times. There's nothing left there now apart from these ancient crosses. But when I went into the church, um, there was a window depicting two scenes of King Arthur, which I thought this was very strange because um, I, I often go in churches and look at stained glass windows and very rarely see King Arthur. So I thought there was kind of some kind of clues that uh, the Masons, the stone masons, had been leaving to show some people the importance of Wally. And, and now it's become the geographical centre of mainland Britain. Um, and it's, it needs to be uh, known. And also, it's, it's on our alignment. A little bit further up the alignment, we come to a Dunsop Bridge. And again, another insignificant village. But it has a phone box from Etch Glass that shows it's the geographical centre of mainland Britain with its outer islands. So only, it's only about five miles north of Wally. So here are two geographical centres upon our alignment. Uh, not only that, the, the, the actual exact spot, which is the centre of, the, of all the British Isles, is below this middle knoll. And nobody seems to know why it's called middle knoll. But the area uh, is called Wittendale. Uh, Witten is a Saxon word for the elders, um, the wise people. And the Witten apparently met uh, under an ancient ash tree at this site. And it's still a, a descendant of that ancient ash tree, still there at Whittendale Farm. Um, so I thought that was symbolically is very interesting. You know, centre of mainland Britain, an ash tree, which in Nordic mythology was the world tree. Um, it's a fascinating area because I've even gone into the, the aspect of the energy currents that we were dowsing. Because I started this um, quest back in 1993. In fact, um, the late Hamish Miller once said to me, when are you going to finish your book? I said, well, you know, when it's ready. He said, because nobody believes me. He said, and you're the only one writing anything uh, near close to what I've experienced with the sun and the serpent. But um, I learned a lot from Hamish about dowsing, and um, he also pointed the way to Shap, in a way, because... Shap is another serpent temple that's uh, very close to my alignment. It's not exactly on it. Because Shap lies in um, a level plain between the Pennine Hills and the Cumbrian Fells. And it's, it's almost like a strip, a flat strip of land. And upon this flat strip of land um, in Neolithic times, a great serpent temple was built. And as you see, uh, Stukri, uh, the great um, antiquarian, described it as a great temple of the old Britons, such as that at Avebury, which it resembles very much. So, interestingly, Avebury is situated close to the middle of the Michael line, and close to the middle of the Belinus line is another serpent temple, and there's only two serpent temples in Britain. So I thought that was significant. Unfortunately, there's, um, it's a big story, Sharp. I could talk her for an hour about Sharp. Um, the circle you see in the bottom photograph um, is called Kemp Howe. And Kemp Howe is by the side of the old A6, which is the main route through Britain um, up until the motorway was built. But unfortunately, you, see, you only see one side of the circle because the other, the other side has been destroyed and there's a railway line running right through the middle of the circle. It's a kind of... Dis destruction I, I got used to seeing in the north of England. Um, and we did some research upon the people who actually destroyed it, who were behind it, the politician. And one of the, the key people behind the destruction of the Shat Temple was actually a British politician back in 1700 and something, the Earls of Longsdale. But um, they also dynamited the other stones. Because from this circle, which is about 50 feet, 60 feet across. Um, there was an avenue of stones ran for about a mile into the village and then connected with a large stone circle. I haven't got diagrams here because I've not got a book published yet, but that we have drawn detailed diagrams. But 
The circle, the central circle, was over 400 feet across in diameter, which makes it, which would have made it the second largest stone circle in, in England. But alas, they were all dynamited, and because in those days the, the, there were dynamite mines, sulfur mines, whatever, in that area that made dynamite, and they had it at hand, and they were, Lonsdales were very wealthy and they could do this. What's amazing about is the stone. You notice the colour of the stone there at the bottom. It's, it's rose-coloured granite. Uh, in fact, it's very similar to Aswan granite in Egypt. So it's, you know, Professor Callahan would call it the, the highest paramagnetic uh, stones. Uh, that it has the most paramagnetic qualities to it. So the ancients understood that this particular stone was, was, in, was important for this complex because this area is known as the Red Granite Area. And um, the old name for Shap was, was thought to uh, derive from Hep, uh, the fruit of the rose, um, which symbolically could be the heart of the rose, which uh, is a mystical place that people say was um, the center of Britain. Um, now, only one standing stone from a great avenue um, it, it exists. The others are leaning over and not so good, but the Goggleby stone, the one I'm standing next to, is the best survivor. You can imagine uh, it would have looked very much like Avebury at its, in its time. It's now gone. But there's a hill called Skellor Hill, which the avenue from the big stone circle continues on to. And from this top of this hill, there used to be a great cairn. And from this cairn, you can see Kemp Howe. Um, it's interesting, like Silbury Hill um, and other places, is a communication area. And Skellow Hill is rather like a Silbury Hill because you can see the start um, of, of the journey from the tail of the avenue and see um, Kemp Howe. If you walk towards Kemp Howe from the villagers' shack, you can't see Skellow Hill. But as soon as you get to within a few feet of the circle, it comes into view. So, you know, the ancients were very good at um, positioning their sites to balance with the, um, the harmony of the landscape. And the other uh, interesting um, alignment I found was between St. Bee's Head and Whitby Abbey. It's a perfect east-west line. Now, St. Bee's Head has often been thought of as a centre, and it is a sacred site in itself. There was a stone circle there at one time. Uh, if you take a line from, from this St. Bee's Head to Whitby Abbey, it passes straight through Kemp Howe, the head of the, the, head of the um, Shap Serpent. But it's interesting that Wainwright, um, the, the great writer who wrote the guides to the Lake District, he was probably um, referring to an ancient route when he wrote his Coast to Coast uh, book, which has been filmed recently. And I think, because it, it starts, the coast to coast route starts at St. Bee's Head and goes through Shap. And there's nothing really at Shap, but it, it's part of an ancient tradition. And I'm just wondering if, if this was something that goes back to really prehistoric times. Now, the other connections with the line is King Arthur. Now, if King Arthur was a real person, he obviously got everywhere. So um, we found him in, in, every, in a lot of countries in Europe, in Italy, um, and in, uh, in Scotland, Wales, England. But, you know, his name is probably allegorical of something else, something that possibly to do with, like, Paul Broadhurst is talking about how Arthur is uh, the bear and the bear is Ursula Major and, like, north-south lines are aligned um, to the afterlife because the pole star never moves in the heavens, and the great bear is almost chained to it because it keeps going around the pole star. And this got me interested because it, you know, we have found a lot of north-south lines throughout the country associated with Arthur it's in, on one or two places along the line. And he asked me, is, is Arthur associated with your line? I said, yeah. I mean, Winchester was the site of, the, of Arthur's court, according to many um, romance writers. Um, Carlisle was another court of King Arthur, where actually um, there is evidence of a, of a building named after Arthur going back to Henry I. A document describes a house called Arthur's Burr that existed in the city. 
So, in fact, Carlisle has more evidence of being a court of King Arthur than any other place in England. Um, and there was other connections there. <laughs> Again, we could talk for hours about this, but um, Arthuret, just north of Carlisle, is, is, the, is the burial ground, or the Avalon, of, of that area of Scotland. And it, it's it, rather like Glastonbury, it was surrounded in like marshy, low-lying areas and a raised platform of land. And inside the church, Arthuret, there was actually a plaque saying uh, King Arthur was buried here. But that was the Arthur that fought the battles around Scotland. Um, again, it could be an allegorical clue that Arthur is just associated with the site because it's on a, on a, a spine of Albion, if you like, or, or an axis. Um, Merlindale and Caddymore Hill, lots of Arthurian connections on the line there. Now, Nolmere, near Clitheroe, is an interesting um, experience we had there because we were actually following one of the earth energy currents associated with the line to Clitheroe Castle. And this, from Clitheroe Castle, it went through Bashel Eaves um, to, to Nolmere Manor and the Sugarloaf, which Guy Ragnar says is a node point along the Glenys line, that's like a limestone reef. Um, so we found that right on the current, um, between uh, the Sugarloaf and Clitheroe was this bed and breakfast, so we decided to stay there. And in the morning, I was talking over with the, 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 um, the proprietor about uh, the, the sort of folklore of the area. He says, oh yeah, he says, King Arthur, he said he rises out of Nomia Lake, rides across the hill here through this place here to Clitheroe. You know, and, and you can imagine there's breakfast everywhere. It's like, what? <laughs> Um, and then we've got Alderley Edge, which is where Arthur sleeps, awaiting England's hour of need. And Alderley Edge is a, a truly a mystical site. And if we were giving this talk in the north, you know, Alderley Edge to, to people may be like an Avebury. Um, and it's a very sacred place. People go there. It's a great fault line as well, which is another clue, as I find, to the earth energies. Uh, the Royal Wright Stones, of course, has, has the legend of sleeping knights. Uh, so does Offington. There's a legend there that says when Arthur wakes, the Offington White Horse will come down from the hill and dance on Dragon Hill. And Babbury Hill is associated with another site of, uh, of Arthur's, one of Arthur's battles. So lots of Arthur places. Um, and it was, you know, as Hugh was inspired by Son of the Serpent, so was I. And so I learnt to douse. Um, which I was, had a, quite a, it was easy to, coming to me because um, I had already been in tune with these megalithic sites for a long, long time. So, and I was already witnessed ley lines, and so dowsing them wasn't uh, a difficult task for me. But um, so after again trying out some of the um, sites on the, on the Michael line and tuning into the female current and the male current, noticing the subtle differences, analysing them. And going to a Hamish workshop as well, and it was great, because he often would come out with me and take me along the section of the uh, Athena line that runs through his property. So we had, um, I learned a lot from Hamish um, about dowsing as well. Um, but basically being diligent, being, practicing it regularly, because he, you know, and he was right, if you don't douse um, regularly, you start to lose a little bit. It's a gift rather like you've got to exercise the mind with and keep going. But in, this, in these days, you know, <laughs> it's just a struggle just to uh, make ends meet, isn't it? Dowsing began for us on the Blenis line at, um, at St. Catherine's Hills, just outside of Winchester. I chose St. Catherine's Hill because it has this folklore around it being local folklore and around Earth mystery people that it's a hub of energy. It's a, a place where many ley lines cross. And it's right on the alignment. So I thought this would be a good place to start. Rather like Hamish started at St. Michael's Mount. So but incredibly, we found here that there was no crossing, but a kind of joining or mating of energies. You see the, the yellow line uh, in the bottom picture is the female current, which winds its way up from St. Cross Hospital, which was a Templar site built by Henry of Blois, um, joins with the male current inside the group of trees that's at the centre of the hill, 
and goes through the, um, through the left side of the chapel and the left hemisphere of the labyrinth. And the male current comes straight north-south um, through the church and through the right hemisphere of the uh, labyrinth, which I thought was highly symbolic. So this is my first experience of the dowsing. That was the, uh, the actual point where the two currents fuse inside the woods. So, doubting the currents, I um, discovered that there's that there's in segments the the actual energy currents. Uh, there's six um, six male, six female, like male, female, male, female, male, female, and all those sort of lines, and that they can be doused by colour. And so we found the female current was violet and the male current was white or yellow. So it's sometimes a way of identifying them because sometimes they're so familiar in certain areas, especially if they're suffering from um, a, a negative site, they, they can sort of shrink and it's difficult to detect. So we have to use sometimes to identify them with colour and uh, colour discs. Uh, and that, their width varies as well. Some, in some areas they can be... Uh, as, as, as large as 20 yards, and, and sometimes they can come down to three feet, depending on the environment. So they're, they're almost um, sort of alive and intelligent. So the Isle of Wight, this is where the alignment begins. And the Isle of Wight is a fascinating island. I'm sure a few of you here have been to the Isle of Wight and looked into a little bit of history, discovered it was once full of megalithic monuments, but for some reason it was wiped clean. Um, and then you probably find there was a lot of churches with, with extremely interesting pagan symbols and, and artefacts, but then they were destroyed as well in Victorian times. So the Isle of Wight has sort of been kept under control, if you like, because, you know, uh, the ancient Britons referred to the Isle of Wight as the Isle of the Druids. In fact, the Druids stayed on the island up until the 7th century AD. And it was one of the last places to be converted to Christianity. Because such was the power of the priesthood there. And I think I know why. Because, you know, if you look at the geology, the geology is always a, a secret. Into the, uh, gives you an insight into what's going on. And there's a, a, a ridge of green sand, um, which is a kind of sandstone, also known as firestone, that runs from the needles... Um, along the ridge. In fact, from an aerial photograph, you'll see this almost like an S shape of ridge in the centre of the island. It's, it's kind of magical in its own way, symbolically. And its head actually looks like the head of a serpent because it has this great bembridge down, which is now the highest hill. And even right where its nose nose comes, there's a rock called the nostrils. And its eye is now the great bembridge fort. So from, from an aerial photograph or Google Earth, you can almost see it's incredible. So, and its tail, there's needles, and it almost looks like a tail. So this serpent-shaped ridge, obviously the ancients under, you know, observed this and understood that it was a... Um, and it's powerful sandstone, full of silica, uh, and it's layered as well. There's many geological layers on the island, so it was kind of like a battery as well, attracting all kinds of uh, energies from the atmosphere. Um, and also all the sacred sites were clustered around the Serpent Hill. Um, many Roman villas were, uh, were around uh, the, the ridge. Also, the only megalithic site, the Longstone, is right on top of this serpent. And we found some megaliths, megaliths um, through some local researchers very close, almost, on the alignment um, near the Roman villa at Braiding. And these megaliths, again, were placed right on top of this alignment, uh, right on top of this neck of the serpent. And there, it could have been a stone circle at one time, we don't know. But um, a lot of work went on to uncovering the mysteries of the Isle of Wight in our book. And um, So I can only give you a brief summary, but um, the mail current enters the island at a little tiny village called Binstead. And here is, disappointingly at first, it was a little Victorian church. <coughs> but we discovered the Victorian church was built on the site of a, a stonemason's sanctuary built by Henry of Blois 
for quarry workers and stonemasons, um, manufacturing stone and for cathedrals such as Winchester, Exeter, and many others. So it was a stonemason's chapel, basically, and it dates back to actually Saxon times. And luckily, one of the only pagan symbols left on the island has been preserved in this church, a sheen in the gig, uh, where she is uh, splaying herself on top of the head of a beast. And also, we noticed on the church there was the Orobolus, the uh, symbol of the snake eating its tail, the griffin, the guardian of treasure. These are ancient carvings that were re preserved from the old church. And there's a green man inside the church and a giant buried in the churchyard. So this was a fascinating little church at, um, after, after we did some research. So this was the first one of the first sites of the, uh, the male current on the island from the north. And, uh, the female current was coming down, further down at Cor Abbey, where Ellen of Aquitaine spent a lot of her time. But it's a fascinating place. The first um, town in mainland Britain that the alignment connects with is, there's a bit of a delay on this, is Titchfield. Um, Titchfield is another insignificant little town. A few of you have probably visited Titchfield. There's a church here with a Saxon tower and an abbey that was um, rebuilt by the, um, the Earl of Southampton. But it used to be a Premisitensian uh, establishment who were linked with the Templars. So we found the first node point inside this church and it seemed uh, an unlikely place. Uh, we was expecting maybe a megalithic site or a sacred place, but just an ordinary church, but then we found the church had Roman tiles on its floor, so it's probably a Roman temple before then, and possibly a stone site, and it lies next to the Meon River. Um, also, the earls of Southampton were buried right next to the node point in this church, with probably one of the most magnificent memorials I've ever seen. It, it's, 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 it's worthy of Westminster Abbey. Um, and the Earls of Southampton were, were key players in political history at the times, and um, one of them was patron of uh, Shakespeare, which we found that Shakespeare actually had stayed at Titchfield Abbey when the Earl of Third Earl of Southampton had uh, re, re, um, remodelled it to look like some kind of Arthurian Gothic castle. Also, yeah, the other thing about Titchfield, we discovered the first person to actually build that church was um, were, were the Geezer family. And they were given um, this land by Rufus, William Rufus, um, who was the son of William the Conqueror. Um, and John de Geezer was the man who actually built the church. And research on him, I discovered he was one of the Grand Masters of the Priory of Zion. So I wondered why this such a great eminent person was actually built this church, unless the, he knew that there was something special there. But many people ask me, okay, where do the Bellina Stein and the Michael Lyon cross, and what's significant about the place? Well, it's kind of a strange story here, because there's nothing that you can get your teeth into, because the Michael Lyon crosses the, the Bellina sign near the, very close to the Seven Barrows. Although if you Google it on Earth, Google Earth, um, you'll see that the very field where they do cross, there is a triangular structure that's um, showing through the, um, as crop marks. So there was something in that very field where they crossed. The Seven Barrows is another interesting site. There is, it's an ancient Bronze Age burial site with mounds, but there's more than seven. There's probably about 15 to 20. But the name Seven is, is being kept there is as important, like the Seven Sisters, or you know the uh, the Seven Stars of the Plow. Um, there's some stellar connection here. Um, now we talk about the energy currents here. The, the male current comes uh, in the red here, comes up from Lambourne, St Michael's Church, through Seven Barrows, straight through the hill fort at Offington, and I, I use the term hill fort loosely because. None of these fortified sites have been proved to be um, for defence or warfare because weapons have never been found. But votive offerings and ritual objects have been found galore in these places. So it's more likely they were built for sacred usage. And I think the Offington Hillport was a ceremonial site. Um, the entrances uh, are significant as well. 
So the mail current goes through Offington Hill for through Dragon Hill, where St. George, the legendary St. George, is supposed to have killed a dragon, leaving a ball patch on top of this tumulus like hill, which is um, supposed to be where his blood uh, burned into the grass and nothing grows there. Continues on through Woolstone, sorry, it continues on towards Farringdon Folly. And the female current winds her way up across the uh, fells through the Ashby estate, which was built for Princess Elizabeth, the Winter Queen, um, as a kind of a, but it, she never actually managed to uh, live in the place, but it was built by a Rosicrucian family. And on, on that very estate is Alfred's castle, where one of the most important um, battles in, in this country took place between the Saxons and the Danes, which King Alfred won. Um, the Ellen Current then continues up, I call the female colony Ellen because Ellen is kind of prehistoric symbol of the goddess and the, the goddess of ley lines and the, the ways the build of straight roads, just to, just to butt in there. She goes up through Wayland Smithy and then cuts through the two fields where the crop circles have been appearing in the last few years. In fact, I went up one, we went up one time to just check the dowsing through Wayland Smithy Long Barrow and then followed it into a field and then turned towards the entrance of Offington Castle. Um, and we discovered the very next day, a crop circle, a great Mayan glyph had appeared in that very field. So it may just be a coincidence, but we're finding now that as we're uncovering this, these currents, there's more and more crop circles appearing on them, as if somehow either we're manifesting them through the knowledge of them or we're reawakening, reawakening them. The female current then swings around down the back of the spine of the white horse through Dragon Hill, crossing with the male there um, on top of the hill, and then coming down the manger, this wonderful <laughs> series of, of steps, um, to Wallstone Springs, which is a tributary of the Thames, and then up to St. Mary's Church, where she crosses with the Mary Current. And what's interesting here is that the Michael Current of the Michael Line and the Mary Current of the Michael Line sort of encompass the area. They don't go through the sacred site. They sort of um, embrace it in a way. <clears throat> but uh, the, 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 the male and female currents of, of uh, the Bolinus alignment are marked <laughs> at all the sacred places. So there's some kind of marriage going on here, this site. So I would say that Uffington is a symbol of the meeting of these two great dragon lines. <clears throat> and in fact, what well, Lurfington White Horse, according to a lot of people, looks more like a dragon than it does a horse. Because it has a beak, uh, it's very long tail, which is more like a dragon. <clears throat> and Dragon Hill, how did it get its name? It's been there for centuries, always known as Dragon Hill. I mean, it should, it, probably referring to this figure as a dragon. So it seems symbolic to us that a white dragon is a symbol of two great dragon energies meeting at this point. And then we discovered Uffington has this tradition of being one of the greatest burial man's burial areas in the Bronze Age. So people from all over Britain were coming to this area to be buried. So they understood that it was a, a natural place of power. The Rollwright Stones uh, is another site. It's not quite on the line, but it's very close. <coughs> but the energies, uh, the male and female, the <coughs> Ellen and Bellinus, both connect with um, the main sites of this um, site, which is the Mainstone Circle, or the King's Men, the Neolithic Barrow, the Whispering Knights, and the Kingstone. Uh, but I was fully expecting something interesting here, because uh, this area has been the subject of the Dragon Project, and lots of people have doused here, so I wasn't, uh, I was kind of nervous, like, what am I going to find? But um, anyway, the female current comes up through the spinney from Little Roll Right, Misses the circle, touches almost the, um, the sort of lunar side of, of the roll right stones, um, and then crosses what they call the Archdury's Barrow, which is just a rise or a, um, a ridge, a small ridge just past the Kingstone. Uh, and then the male current comes up through the Whispering Night, um, <coughs> missing the circle, but heading towards the Kingstone, going through the Kingstone and crossing on this ridge. Um, which was thought to be a long barrel. So I thought that was interesting, but when I researched the folklore, there's more folklore around this ridge being a place of sleeping nights underneath, and that the Kingstone was part of this barrow. 
and also that fairies live around this mound. Um, all kinds of strange things have happened here. It's part of a, 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 probably a fault line. And uh, it sort of made sense that this was the crossing point. And a few years after I discovered this, some people independently had, had made a stone circle on top of this, right where the no point is, as if somebody knew it was there. The other site of interesting, uh, uh, another node point is at the Holy Trinity Church at Stratford, uh, the very place where Shakespeare is buried. And this, the currents seem to connect with Shakespeare places and Shakespeare themes from Titchfield all the way up to, um, to Stratford. And we had a very interesting time mapping it all out and double checking it and double checking it. Um, because, you know, dowsing through towns and villages can be. Um, can be quite embarrassing at times and, <laughs> and tricky. But um, Shakespeare is born on St. George's Day, and he died on St. George's Day. You know, and some of these myths are allegories of some importance. And we found such many, many of these allegories up and down the line along these currents. A Bar Beacon is another site that's on the alignment and where the two currents cross. And there's evidence that Bar Beacon was, well, it is one of the most uh, prominent hills in the Midlands. It's probably the highest hill in the Midlands. And it's said to be the home of the Archdruid um, of the Midlands who lived on top of this hill. And so, again, we were finding the node points were, were sort of attaching themselves to folklore of the old um, priests of this um, country. And a lot of the uh, roots of the, the currents were following paths said to have been taken by certain saints. Uh, again, I could talk hours about what we found, but I'm going to just um, introduce a couple of new sacred sites. If you don't know, have you heard of the cloud, anybody? No, has anybody heard of the cloud in the Midlands? One person, two people, a couple, okay. The cloud is, is, is a place that um, highlights a natural phenomena. Um, called the double, su double setting sun. From Leek Church, you almost have this view, well, it's a bit further forward. But the sun, um, basically, and this is interesting, at, only at the summer solstice does the sun come down at this angle, set behind this ridge, and appear here. So you, it, it sort of rises again, or appears again. And the ancients saw this as very significant. And Leek Church is built on a prehistoric mound. And it's said that maybe going back to the Bronze Age, maybe in Neolithic times, they were observing this uh, event. But unfortunately, the, the procession of the equinox, uh, procession of uh, uh, the planets now, it's now further, uh, further over. So it, um, it actually set a long time before. So, um, but somebody had worked it out that it was perfect there about 3000 BC. But I was interested in the cloud itself, because on top of the cloud, there is... Um, these carvings in, in the rock, which, um, which are probably prehistoric, and they're all over the area where the sun goes behind this rock, where the rock sticks out. And this is also where we found two currents were noding on this point, and it's also on the alignment, the cloud. So it's a, a significant sign, but we didn't know very much about the cloud, so I started to do some research and discovered in a saddle of the cloud, this great ridge, um, are these bride stones. And the bride stones, according to a local author, was one of the biggest long barrows in the country. It was bigger than West Kennet Long Barrow. It was a court tomb with two entrances. And again, it, w it was completely dynamite, destroyed uh, over a period of 200 years from the 17th century to the Victorian times. And, Lots of stone was taken away for building the roads, the walls, rockeries for local houses. Um, it's, it's a shame, but there's still enough here to see that it still feels um, a sacred site whenever you go there. But the bride stones are significant because it lies in this notch here. This is the cloud. And the cloud at one time was much higher than this because, um, like Portland in Dorset, they've taken off a good slice of the top of the hill for quarrying. And there was actually a rock feature called Billy Bumble, which is a very extraordinary um, 
rock. So from Martin Church, um, which was also on, on the male current, I was following, I followed a female current. Um, I was dousing it through the mound, and, and this church on top of the mound, and I looked back and I saw this view, and then discovered that from the, at this point, um, the, the um, winter solstice um, sun rises out of this notch, um, and somebody's actually photographed it. So I think that the ancients have built uh, this mound as an observation place, and then eventually a church has been built on it. So this is what I discovered uh, from Martin Church here. The winter, sol winter solstice sunrise comes out. Here are the bride stones in the saddle of the cloud. I also found another great mound with a church at St. George's at Ashbury. Asbury. And here you would see the equinox sunrise rising over the bride stones. And at Mocarp, this um, folly, which you can see if anybody traveling up north through Cheshire, <laughs> stands out for miles. If you stand on the cop, on Mo Cup, um, you'll see the sunrise at the summer solstice, right through the notch in the Bridestones. So, and we also discovered a true north line that goes to St. Michael's Church in Macclesfield. So this, this particular hill, <coughs> and it's full of folklore and mythology, and I could go on for hours about what we found there. I could do a whole lecture on the cloud. But what we found is, is a landscape temple. That's very important. Um, further up the line in Cumbria, we discovered the very centre, the very centre of, of the line between the Isle of Wight and the top of Scotland, there's a little village called Stainton. And at Stainton there used to be an abbey, um, which was destroyed completely. But um, the monuments called the Dacry Bears were, were, were taken to a nearby church. And you remember I was talking about bear chained to the pole? And here in the churchyard, these four bears, and this one, this is a bear that clinging to a pole. And it seemed to us perfect uh, um, that, that on the, the middle of the line, a polar line, um, there is this bear clinging to a pole. Sorry, I'm in trouble with this. OK, Carlisle. <coughs> Carlisle is once a court of Arthur. We discovered that the currents come up through St. Gothbert's Church, cross in the cathedral itself. It was through the, uh, the, the, the castle of, um, of Henry II. So Carlisle was very important. We found the crossing at Winchester in the cathedral, a crossing at Carlisle in the cathedral and the crossing in Dunfermline Cathedral, where Robert the Bruce is buried. So the three old capitals, these currents were crossing in the main religious sites. And at Arthur at Church, remember I was talking about before, where they, they believe the Scottish Arthur is buried, uh, the female current comes through the graveyard here, right through this tower. And there's a little thing on the tower here, you can just see, and the stonemasons have carved a grail into the tower, as if they were, and there seems no point in it. But there it is. It's as if the stonemasons were also aware of the earth energies in that area. Well, I could give another lecture on what we found in Scotland, but um, unfortunately we haven't got time. I'm running out of time. But um, Cadimore Hill uh, is another site of Arthur's Battle. The Dunfern we've talked about. Fort Teviot was one of the most sacred places of the Picts, who had a palace and a, ro a royal seat here. Pict Lockery, the most central town in Scotland. Um, Loch Inch, a Druid sanctuary um, with a, gro a Druid grove and ancient stones. Culloden, a key battle site, as we all know. And Laig being the, um, <coughs> the center, prehistoric center of Caithness. And it ends actually at Durness. Uh, according to Guy Raglan, Hope is the place where the line ends, but on Google Earth and other programs, the line actually uses, uh, curves a little bit and actually goes through Durness. And at Durness, we found that the alignment goes straight through this church called Balnakeel. And Balnakeel is one of the most ancient churches in the whole of Caithness. It goes back to the Saxon times, and the, the bishops of Caithness had their palace there, right by this um, church where the currents cross at the end. And also, the peninsula that, uh, that, uh, that is just north of the church is shaped like a dragon. 
So it, it seemed absolutely perfect right at the end, after finishing <coughs> the journey, that is symbol of the dragon. Um, just a little plug in my own book, which I had time to write in between all this. Um, in my own back garden, if you like, Portland uh, often called to me, like megalithic sites do. And after uncovering some of its history, I mean, yeah, it's a naval base, it's uh, um, a, uh, an Alcatraz, if you like, of uh, southern England with all the prisons on it, and a great quarry. It's also a sacred island, because Causeway Islands were sacred to the ancients, uh, because there were places where you could connect with the dead, because a lot of their kings were buried on islands, and uh, uh, like St. Michael's Mount, Mont Saint Michel, Lindis Farm, they're all Causeway Islands were sacred. And the limestone is also significant. It's a very special limestone in Portland. And I'm sure the ancients understood the qualities, the electrical qualities or insulating qualities of limestone. It was an ancient burial ground of kings. As many, there were seven stone circles on the island before the quarry and destroyed them all in Victorian times. There's, there's still five holy wells on the island. <clears throat> there's prehistoric tracks still marked out, sacred hills, uh, ley lines galore, um, Landscape geometry, uh, I discovered many of the churches are aligned to, to the Vesica Pisces. It's the only example I know of the perfect Vesica Pisces, um, apart from maybe the one north of Avebury. <clears throat> uh, ancient caves with, with lots of legends, ruined churches, pentagonal castle built of cyclopean stone, no mortar used, rather like the European megalithic sites. Uh, supernatural events galore on Portland because of the underground water and the, the type of stone and the layering. It's almost like a great battery. And sea monsters. <clears throat> and if anybody would like a copy, see me downstairs. And thank you all for listening. That's the end for this one. <laughs>